Hello. It'll be a year next month since OpenAI first launched ChatGPT. The generative AI solution was like nothing else the world had seen, becoming the fastest growing app of all time and spurring the creation of an entirely new AI industry. More than 40 billion in venture capital funding has been allocated to AI firms since 2023 began. With all the big players following suit with their closed and open sourced LLMs, as well as enterprise level strategies to make the most of the new generative AI capabilities, whether that's buying, blending, or even building your own from scratch. Three weeks ago, I was at a business event in Amsterdam on behalf of my employer, talking to a large number of companies from all across Europe about AI. And whilst many of them were still grappling with how to even tackle the new opportunities and challenges of Gen AI, I was inviting them to recognise that this was just the very start of a huge wave of new capability and that the very near future of LLMs were no longer even going to be called LLMs. But now what is probably going to become known as LMMs. And what are LMMs? These are the large multimodal AI models that extend LLMs from a simple written language interface where you type your question and get a typical answer back to an AI with multi-sensory skills and visual understanding that allows it to achieve a much stronger generic intelligence and one that interacts much more seamlessly with how we humans interact with the world. The first of these LMMs are emerging and have emerged in the last week or so, OpenAI's GPT-4V being the most publicised not even available for us mere mortals outside of the US right now, but other models are being developed and being made available right now too. Um, not least LAVA, which stands for Large Language and Vision Assistant, which connects pre-trained visual encoder and large language models um, with an open source chatbot fine-tuned from a LAMA-based model. And a new paper published just last Friday, um, researchers have been experimenting with how these large multimodal models can evolve the capabilities of LLMs in ways that are completely unprecedented. And I read this paper, all 166 pages of it, and even though I knew a lot of this already and a lot of it was coming, it's still one of the most exciting papers I've read probably since the Sparks of AGI paper that I uh, talked to Casey Dorman, um, the famous AI sci-fi author, about a few weeks ago. I think you're going to be blown away by some of the capabilities that these new LMMs will bring to us very soon. And the good news is that this isn't going to be just the domain of massive, expensive and closed and indeed generalist GPT models, but the capabilities will come in much more refined and specialist applications, either that you will buy or even blend with your own data and models, more of which at the end of this episode. You're watching Eye for AI, bringing artificial intelligence to all of humanity. So this 166 page research paper that's literally just out last week is called The Dawn of LMMs, Preliminary Explorations with GPT-4V or 4Vision. Um, and whilst this is around the OpenAI product, as I said, there are others there and we'll talk a little bit about Lava, um, as well as one or two other LMMs that are starting to emerge um, in the market. Uh, if I skip down to some of the examples, because this is really where it gets um, particularly interesting. Uh, and let's just start with the very simplest level of describing images, recognizing images, analyzing images across a whole set of different, as they call, diverse domains. First one, celebrity recognition description. Here's a picture of eight celebrities who uh, most of you will know and love. Um, and the prompt simply says, describe this image. GPT-4V comes back. The image shows a collage of eight prominent personalities from different fields. On the top row from left to right, there is a singer, Justin Bieber, footballer Lionel Messi, footballer Cristiano Ronaldo, and an entrepreneur, Elon Musk, and so on. So, very good. And then if you take it a little bit further, you can uh, prompt it with, who is this person in the image, and what is this person doing? GPT-4 comes back. The person in the image is Jenshin Huang, the CEO and co-founder of NVIDIA. He's holding and presenting a product from NVIDIA, likely a graphics processing unit, um, which is uh, quite an interesting addition to, uh, to the uh, image description. They go on to looking at landmarks, and this becomes 
even uh, you know a little bit more uh, impressive in my view. Um, so describe describe the landmark in this image. GPT-4V comes back. The landmark in this image is the Space Needle, an observation tower located in Seattle, Washington, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I knew that one. Um, it's a very famous landmark, um, so perhaps not that surprising that the image recognition would recognize that and uh, be able to explain that in language. Um, but if you start looking through some of these other examples, there's a temple um, in Kyoto, Japan, um, which is also famous, but perhaps less well known, certainly to, uh, to us in the Western world. Um, there's quite a famous one here, obviously, of Times Square in New York. But then this last one, is um, says describe the landmark in the image. The landmark in the image is the famous Lombard Street in San Francisco, California, known for its steep hairpin turns. Now that is not that obvious to me in terms of the overall picture with all the flowers in the background. So for GPT four V or any LMM to actually be able to take that picture and analyze it down to a very specific road and location in a city in a country in the world is uh, is pretty impressive. Um, and there are, there are more um, image descriptions, um, images and images des descriptions. And this last one here, I thought was pretty impressive. It says, describe the landmark in this image. Um, and it's a set of pillars and some steps, but to me, that is really not that clear. Um, GPT-4V comes back, the landmark in the image is the Fushimi Inari Taishi Shrine in Kyoto, Japan, um, which is indeed obviously famous, but um, that as a picture and recognition of a picture is pretty interesting. And so therefore, you know, an LLM can accurately recognize landmarks and geolocate pictures from around the world and across the world. So, you know, just think of the many, many applications that that could be put to use. And then if you come into the second area of image descriptions and you look at food recognition, so here, um, describe the name of the... Is describe the name of the dish. And GPT-4V comes back with not only recognising what the dish is, but describing where it comes from and telling you what is in the dish. And it goes on to do that with a number of other examples of food. And then maybe coming on to medical imaging. Um, and remember, this is a general purpose model. This has not been specifically trained on scientific data for a specific use case. This is still trained on the whole or a large proportion of the internet. So if you think about taking this level of accuracy and understanding into a narrower domain where you may uh, train a LMM on a more specific corpus of data that's relevant to a particular use case. And you can start to see how you'll be able to reduce the cost, reduce the training, and actually still keep the accuracy of such a model. So medical image understanding. The prompt says, describe this image. And there's a picture of a x-ray below it, clearly of a, of a human skull. And GPT-4V comes back. The image is a black and white x-ray of a human skull. View from the front. Um, the top and the bottom are visible, etc., etc. The image is labelled with an L, as indeed it is, on the bottom right-hand corner, indicating that it's the left side of the skull. Prompt then goes on to continue and says, are there wisdom teeth that need to be removed in this x-ray image? GPT-4V comes back. It's difficult to say for sure whether the wisdom teeth need to be removed from this x-ray image as there are other factors that it should be considered, such as the age of the patient and the position of the teeth. However, it appears that the wisdom teeth on the bottom left and right sides of the jaw are partially impacted, meaning they are not fully emerged from the gum line. This could be a reason for removal, as impacted wisdom teeth can cause pain, infection and other problems. So, again, and these have been checked by a you know medical professional, um, that is clearly an accurate uh, an accurate answer. Um, and then it goes on to say, in which wisdom tooth is the hardest to remove? GPT-4V comes back. The lower wisdom tooth, especially those that are impacted, are typically considered the hardest to remove. 
This is because the lower jawbone is denser, etc., etc. So again, it gives a really solid explanation as to which wisdom teeth are the hardest to remove. So that's just around a jawline. Let's try and uh, look at a specific problem with an x-ray. So medical image understanding. Prompt, what's wrong? Here's an image and here is a picture of a foot. GPT-4V comes back, says there appears to be a fracture or break in the fifth metatarsal bone, the bone on the outside of the foot that connects to the pinky toe. And you can see there, there is indeed a break. And there are more of those examples of CT scans and so forth. If we then come on to the next um, set of examples, which are more around recognizing logos and being able to describe those. So first of all, it is simply here are three logos, well-known logos of car companies and cheap BD4V um, quite naturally gets those pretty accurately correct. Um, you can describe the logos in details, um, but what happens when you actually put those in the wild? Can um, an LLM actually recognize logos of objects that are taken naturally uh, in the day-to-day -day world. And here's some pictures that do just that. So first of all here is the Golden Arches of McDonald's and GPT-4V recognizes that this image is of a McDonald's French fry container filled with golden brown French fries, yum. And on the right um, is an example of two Starbucks cups, different Starbucks cups. One is a clear plastic one with a lid and a straw, and the other is a white paper cup with a lid. So pretty accurate in terms of being able to uh, pull that out. So I was going to now give you an example from, and remember I haven't got access to GPT-4V at the moment, but I do have access to Lava. So what I was going to do is I was just going to try something on the Lava model for you, which was to take an image of let me just find this we'll upload an image and we'll call it uh, this one which was Nike so we'll upload that image and the prompt I was going to use is what brand is this shoe And Lava comes back and says, this shoe is a Nike brand. So, so far, so good. Uh, now, tell me the full name of the shoe. The full name of the shoe is Nike Air Jordan 1 Retro High Blue. Okay, so... That's pretty impressive. So you could take that into a shop or type that in and clearly go and buy a Nike Air Jordan 1 Retro in the high blue. So the next example is scene understanding. And we see here that the, here is an image um, taken from a car dashboard camera and it says, describe the image. GPT-4V comes back, the image is a view of a road from the perspective of a car dashboard camera. The road has two lanes and the car is in the right lane behind a silver vehicle. There are two yellow signs on the side of the road warning drivers of an upcoming pedestrian crossing and a curve to the left. The sky is cloudy and grey and trees and bushes line the side of the road. That's pretty impressive in terms of its understanding and, and visualisation of that, of that image. Um, if you look at the full self-driving video that I did around Tesla and uh, autonomous driving, uh, the ability of a transformer based system to actually understand and recognize and react to um, visual cues in real time is something that's really challenging but also becoming a reality more and more each day and so the power of an LMM to be able to enrich that still further is is pretty impressive. Um, image description so even where you have an image that is um, counter counterfactual if you like to the uh, the description that you're being given um, can an LMM 
identify that or does it kind of hallucinate along with your um, inferred suggestion? So over here on the right, um, the prompt is, can you see the bright blue feathers on this bird's wing? GPT-4V, uh, no, I cannot see bright blue feathers on the bird's wing. It appears to have brown and white feathers. Well done, LMM. Can you find the baseball player wearing a blue shirt in this picture? GPT-4V, no, I can't find a baseball player wearing a blue shirt in the image. All the players appear to be wearing black shirts. And then on to uh, the next area. Um, thinking about spatial relationship, um, localization of objects within a area and counting and captioning so uh, this is a good one uh, this picture says does the per you know is the person bigger than the car well actually physically within the frame of the picture the person is clearly bigger than the car but in reality we all know that's perspective and know the car is of course bigger than the person and GPT-4V gets this. Um, no, the car appears to be bigger than the person in the image. However, the perspective and distance of the objects in the photo may affect their perceived size. Very good. Now, object counting. Count the number of apples in the image. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are seven apples in the image, says GPT-4V. Now, it doesn't get every single answer right. There are one or two here that actually it gets wrong um, so clearly we still need to be careful of the answers that we get from our LMMs as much as we are from our LLMs but still pretty uh, pretty impressive performance um, and then one that I particularly like is one around dense captioning and it gives you a picture um, here's a picture of four rather famous individuals from the field of AI and it says please follow the instructions tell me the size of the input image then localize each person in the image using a bounding box, recognize each person and generate a detailed caption of each bounding box. And GPT-4V comes back saying, okay, it knows what the size of the image is in pixels. It then locates the location of each of those individuals um, with a bounding box. It tells you who each of the individuals is. And finally, it generates a caption for each of those bounding boxes. And then if you do a simple visualization of, of what that could turn into in terms of a automated um, piece of imagery that you might want to use for, for an article, um, here you go. It's got the dense captioning um, for our four AI heroes. Pretty impressive. Um, now, it's not just about sort of image, image recognition and being able to draw down facts from that, but it's about inferences that are more subtle. So can it understand things that are jokes or memes? And then can it actually represent more detailed understanding of science or knowledge? <clears throat> so let's look at an example of that. So here's, here's one of the uh, meme examples. Um, the prompt says, can you explain this meme? And the meme is uh, Kermit, the frog, I assume it's Kermit the frog, is sat on a bed, it looks like, um, relaxing and saying, uh, it says, me, I'll do it at eight. Time is 8.05. Me, looks like I've got to wait till nine now. GPT-4V explains this as this meme is poking fun at the idea of procrastination and how someone may be put off doing a task until a certain time. But if they miss that time, they'll push it back even further. In this case, the person in the meme planned to do something at eight o'clock. But since it's now 8.05, they have decided to wait until nine o'clock to do it. The image of Kermit the Frog relaxing in bed represents the person's desire to procrastinate and avoid the task. Um, pretty solid understanding of a meme there, um, which is better than I, I normally do. Um, and this I love as well. So in terms of science and knowledge, so suppose you have this picture, um, which I'm sure lots of us remember pictures like this from our, uh, our science lessons. Um, the prompt says, suppose you are a teacher. Please use the figure to explain the distinction between evaporation and evapotranspiration. And GPT-4V actually gives a really quality answer and this is again don't forget based purely on interpreting this image 
It says, OK, class, today we're going to learn about the distinction between evaporation and evapotranspiration. Let's take a look at this figure. First, let's understand what evaporation is. Evaporation is the process by which water is changed from its liquid state to its gaseous state. This usually takes place at the surface of a liquid, like the ocean or a lake, when the water molecules gain enough energy to break away and form water vapour. So in this figure, we can see that the water in the lake and the dam is evaporating and becoming water vapour. <clears throat> now let's look at evapotranspiration. This is a combination of two processes, evaporation and transpiration. Transpiration is the process by which plants release water vapour through their leaves. So in this figure, we can see that the trees and plants are releasing water vapour <clears throat> into the air, which is the transpiration part of evapotranspiration. At the same time, the water in the soil and the surface is also evaporating. This combination of evaporation and transpiration is what we call evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration. Very good. Next, um, understanding what is happening within an image. <clears throat> so, very simply, you know, what is person three doing? And it says here, person three is carrying a plate of food, likely serving it to the customers at the table. It appears they are working as a waiter or a server in a restaurant. Pretty impressive. This picture. Suppose you are a detective. What can you infer from the visual clues in this image? GPT-4V comes back from the visual clues in this image. I can infer that the room belongs to someone who is likely a young adult or a teenager, as evidenced by the casual clothing and the desk with the computer. The person is likely a student or someone who works from home, as evidenced by the desk and the computer. The person is likely fashion conscious, as evidenced by the multiple jackets and shoes. The person is likely located, sorry, the room is likely located in a colder climate, as evidenced by the jacket and the boots. The person is likely not very tidy, as evidenced by the cluttered desk and the clothes hanging on the door, etc. And then if we move down to um, yet yeah, more examples of um, understanding text within scenes. So, you know, from as simple as what is X in the following equation? And we have here a handwritten um, X plus three in brackets squared equals four. GPT 4V comes back and says, without any context, um, about what the equation is representing, we can only assume that x is a variable or unknown quantity. In this equation, x plus 3, etc., etc., etc. And so it goes on to say, so in this equation, x could be either minus 1 or 5. And then coming over to the right-hand side, and again, I'm going to skip over to, um, to Lava for this and just load up a, um, a picture and try it for real. Um, so if I go across to lava and load up this picture and let me just ask it to say <clears throat> if um, using the theorem theorem on the picture if a equals 1 and b equals 3, what does c equal? Oops. And it comes back saying, in the image, there is a chalkboard with a triangle in the Pythagorean Pythagorean theorem written on it. Theorem states that right angle triangle, the square of the length of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the length of the other two sides. If A equals 1 and B equals 3, we can substitute these values into the theorem thus. Therefore, if A equals 1 and B equals 3, C equals the square root of 10. Very good. Um, and then there's some really good examples around how you can use uh, flowcharts and diagrams to then turn into alternative representations that you might want. So, for example, a, a simple flowchart as to a process that you are 
trying to follow within a computer program, can you translate this uh, flowchart into Python code? Now, it's a fairly simple um, flowchart, but here indeed is the Python code that represents that simple flowchart. So now we have a way of actually not just creating code from a description of the code in, in language, we actually have a way of creating code from a flowchart or from a diagram of the actual user interface that you want to create. And that's pretty, pretty remarkable. Uh, and let's keep going down. So many good examples here. So multilingual, uh, multimodal, multimodal understanding. Um, this is where we're actually looking at different languages. So we can put the prompt in um, different languages shown across the top here. Here's three different languages and the prompt comes back in the language of uh, the prompt. And here um, you've asked for the description of the image in three different languages and it comes back again with the description in those languages. And what about scene text recognition? So actually um, for different multi-lingual um, challenges, uh, this is an Arabic phrase um, and the scene text, which is from a what looks like a, a, a sign or a, a piece of artwork above a doorway, um, is recognised by the LMM. Likewise, Musée d'Orsay, uh, sorry, Musée de Louvre, is recognised by the scene text in the LMM here uh, and again. So many examples of scene text being accurately um, drawn out from an image, which again is pretty impressive stuff. Uh, if I keep going down here, and I strongly recommend you uh, get hold of this um, paper and have a proper read of it yourself because it's just um, incredible. Um, so multilingual, multicultural understanding. So this is about taking uh, an image and recognizing what the geolocation of that image is and then creating a summary of the image in the language corresponding to that geolocation. So here it picks up that this is an image that shows a couple dressed in traditional Chinese wedding attire sitting in front of a wall of red roses and a gold Chinese character for double happiness. Um, and it's, as it says in the prompt, it's described it both in English and the local language corresponding to the geolocation, which in this case is Chinese. And there are more examples of that. Um, and if I keep coming down further and further, there's then some really interesting um, pieces around how best do you interact between an LLM, LMM and a human and the fact that actually an LMM can understand a whole set of different visual markers that could actually help you um, denote or point to points of interest or areas that you want to explore in greater detail in a image. So for example, here's some obvious ones where it says describe the pointed image in the image. Um, the region in the image, describe the pointed region in the image. And in these cases, it can be different shapes. It can be an arrow, it can be different colors. It can be um, roughly drawn circles. And those visual pointers will actually help the LMM um, narrow in on what is the focus of the question that you have. Um, and it can even explain to you um, where a region is based upon um, the coordinates of the overall picture and it can describe where a particular image or where a particular item in this picture in this case for example the beer bottle um, where exactly is that beer bottle in the image and then we move on to visual referring prompting which is where you actually put prompts within the image to help um, trigger the LMM to take the appropriate action. So for example, this picture 
um, fairly famous picture of what is the missing image um, shows obviously the, uh, the diamond at the top and the bottom and the star on the right hand side. Uh, but rather than leave it entirely to try and make up um, what the next image would be, and in which case there's actually a couple of couple of examples that could probably work for that, by providing a little bit of extra information in terms of the fact that the dot has been added and the arrow goes from the top to the bottom, and there's an arrow on the right-hand side with a question mark to try and uh, denote that what do you need to do to the star to make it become this missing image. Um, unsurprisingly, um, the uh, the LMM gets it right and says, based on this pattern, we can predict that the next image will be a star with a dot in the center. Bang on. And then if we keep coming down here to some even more examples and actually thinking about time and video, because clearly images are just a single moment in time. But if you have a multiple set of images, that could represent um, a set of images taken over a period of time. And ultimately, that becomes, in essence, a video. Uh, if we look at some of the examples around this, which are really uh, quite impressive. So here are a set of images, uh, one, two, three, four, five images that have all been put together uh, of somebody preparing some sushi and the images have basically been mixed up and the prompt says analyze the images and decide the correct order in which they should be displayed and GPT-4V comes back with the images in the correct order it says one should be E which is mixing the rice two then placing the rice on the seaweed three adding the fillings four it's cutting the roll and five it's the finished sushi rolls on the place, uh, on the plate. Um, and then if I come down here a little bit further, and one that I love is this temporal localization and reasoning example, which basically has six pictures of uh, a game of football, six images from a basically a penalty being taken. And the prompt is, in which frame does the player kick the ball? Did the goalkeeper block the ball? And if you look at the images, you can see player running in, player running in, player just about to kick the ball, player has kicked the ball, the ball is right next to the goalkeeper, and in the final image, you can see that the goalkeeper has missed the ball, and it looks like it's nestled in the back of the net. So, GPT-4V, what did you get? The player kicks the ball at frame C, which is correct. Oh, no, hang on, sorry, this is C. Yeah, C. Um, the ball was not blocked by the goalkeeper, as it can be seen in frame F uh, here in the net, and the goalkeeper is on the ground. So, correct. And you can start to see a whole number of different um, potential use cases both for you know consumer and for enterprise around the ability to um, start to truly analyze and recognize what's happening in both a single image, a set of um, consecutive images, a set of mixed up images, and ultimately a full set of images that are uh, combined into a, a video, um, which is clearly not gonna be very far away. Uh, a few more examples I wanted to get through to. Now, moving on to abstract visual stimuli. Um, a tangram, as you probably know, is a geometric puzzle which has uh, seven flat pieces and you can form different shapes um, from those pieces. And the prompt here says, uh, here, here are 10 abstract tangram. Which one best illustrates a flying goose? What do the other figures look like? So this is all about looking at an abstract um, picture, if you like, and recognizing a, an image from within that. And the LMM comes back. The tangram that best illustrates a flying goose is number seven. Looks pretty good. Um, it has the triangular shape of a goose's body and wings, and the smaller triangle at the top could represent the head and the neck. The other figures could represent 
other things. Um, number one could be a rocket or a tower. Number two, a butterfly or a bat. Number three, a question mark or a snake. Number four, a person or a robot. Five, mountain range or a crown, or, and so on. Um, and then looking at how you would associate parts of different objects and how you could put those together in a certain way or a certain format to create something different. Um, and this prompt has three pictures, um, which are a little bit abstract. And it says, how are those visual parts related and can they be combined to form a single object such as a boy? If so, how to arrange them? So I think here we have probably um, some buttons on a chest. Here we have some legs and some hands. And here we have something that to me looks a bit like a head. So what does the LMM come up with? The three visual parts are related and they are all components that could be used to create a single object. In this case, the object is a boy. To combine these parts to form a boy, we can arrange them in the following way. The first image, the cardboard with orange and green shapes, could be used as the body of the boy. The second image, uh, okay, the second image or the pair of jeans could be used as the legs of the boy. The third image, the cardboard with yellow, red and blue shapes could be used as the head of the boy. By arranging these shapes in this way, we can create a single object that resembles a boy. And there you have the visualization. Um, so that's pretty remarkable as well, I think, in terms of how it actually takes something that's quite abstract and can understand and recognize the pattern and create a, a sensible image from it. Um, the, um, the paper then goes on to use a couple of interesting further sort of adult intelligence scales and there's one called the Weschler adult intelligence scales scale um, and a few questions from here. So which one of the five um, is least like the other four? Carrot, potato, corn, apple, bean. And GPT-4V comes back, um, D, apple. Explanation, carrot, potato, corn and bean are all vegetables while apple is a fruit. Okay, fairly obvious. Next one, Tom, 12 years old, is three years, uh, sorry, three times as old as his sister. How old will Tom be when he is twice as old as his sister? 18, 21, 16, 20 or 15. Uh, the LMM comes back, if Tom is three times as old as his sister, his sister is one third of his age. So his sister is four years older. Now we need to figure out when Tom will be twice as old as his sister. This means that his sister's age will be half his age. So we need to find the number that is double the age of four. The answer is eight. So Tom will be 16 years old when he is twice as old as his sister. The correct answer is therefore C, 16. Prompt, which one of the five pictures is least like the other four? So there's four blobs and a central one, three blobs and a central one, four and a central one. Um, three and a central one, three and a central one. Um, and the answer is D. D is the list like the other four because it's the only one that does not have a central point connecting all the other points. Very good. And uh, which one of the five designs here makes the best comparison? So hand is to glove as foot is to is it hat, football, shoe, top, shorts. Answer C, the black dress shoe. The analogy is comparing a hand to a glove and a foot to a shoe. The best comparison would be the black dress shoe as it's an item of clothing that's worn on the foot just like a glove is worn on the hand. So again, just remember, this is a generally purpose trained um, LMM that is able to take in images, recognise the patterns within the images, recognise what's in an image, the meaning of the image, and to draw inferences and patterns from those images in exactly the same way that the LLM has been doing with um, natural language for us for um, you know the past year and more. So again, a couple of examples from a fairly common test for IQ which is called Raven's Progressive Matrix, which is where you have to find the pattern uh, in the first column and use it to infer um, a missing image. Um, so the prompt is find the pattern in the first column and use it to infer the missing figure in the second column. Choose a drawing that fits the empty space. And the correct drawing that fits the empty space according to the LMM is the upside down triangle. This is because the pattern in the grid is that each row and column has only one shape in different orientations. And here's one that's a little bit more complicated. 
um, three rows of arrows in different directions, figure out, um, find out the pattern in the first two rows and use it to infer the missing figure in the third row. And the LMM gets it right again. Um, it says the figure that is um, that is missing is C um, because it's rotated 90 degrees clockwise from the figure in the previous cell. If I keep scrolling down, it then goes on to actually uh, recognizing emotions from images that are presented. Uh, there's a few here. Um, this one's a good one. Identify and read emotions of people from their faces as shown in the image below. The emotion shown in the image is fear or anxiety. The person's eyes are wide open and their mouth is slightly open, indicating a sense of shock and awe. Uh, sorry, shock or surprise. Their hands are covering their mouth, which could suggest that they're trying to suppress a scream or gasp. And then still further, and this is quite an interesting one from a, from a use case, if you think about how you might use a L, LM and an LMM to generate images and then identify whether that image was going to have the desired effect to... Um, on your on your customer or your intended um, recipient of that image, it says prompt after seeing the below image how people might emotionally feel and react. And GPT four V says people might feel happy and relaxed when seeing this image. They might react with a smile or a feeling of warmth and comfort. This image appears to be a couple at a music festival. So people might also feel a sense of excitement and anticipation for the music and performance. And there's a whole set of other pictures here that um, you know, arouse different um, intent. Here, and here's another one. Image aesthetics. Um, aesthetics reflects the perceived beauty or visual appeal of an object. This goes the prompt. Design or piece of art by a human. Among the images provided below, based on societal standards and norms, which one more will, will more people consider having a higher aesthetic? Is it the picture of the skyscrapers and the um, park in the middle? Or is it this slightly more industrial picture of um, roads and buildings in a city? Um the LMM comes back, most people would likely consider the first image to have a higher aesthetic value. This is because the image is more visually appealing with a variety of colours, buildings and greenery. The second image is less visually appealing with a more monochromatic colour scheme and less variety in the buildings and landscape. Additionally, the first image is a more iconic and recognisable location, New York City, which may also contribute to this perceived aesthetic value. Very interesting. And finally, on the um, on the kind of the, the emotional conditioned output, there's a picture here and it says, describe the image to make people feel uneasy and anxious. <clears throat> and it's a picture of a staircase, a dark staircase. And um, in order to give that emotional feeling from the language, uh, the LMM comes out with... The image is of a dark, shadowy staircase. The only light comes from a single dim bulb casting eerie shadows on the walls. The railing is old and rusted with peeling paint and jagged edges. The stairs themselves are uneven and creak underfoot. The air is thick and musty. There is a feeling of unease as if someone is lurking in the shadows. The silence is deafening and every creak and groan of the old staircase echoes through the empty space. Wow. And then turn it on its head. Describe the image to make people feel relaxed and comforted. The image is of a dimly lit staircase with ornate railings. The light is soft and creates a peaceful atmosphere. The shadows of the wall add depth and texture to the image, making it feel cosy and inviting. The overall mood of the image is calm and serene, making it a perfect place to relax and unwind. How you can view the same picture into incredibly different ways um, gives rise to you know so many I guess of the both opportunities and quite a few of the concerns of how we will use LLMs and LMMs to um, influence people um, be that through elections or their shopping behaviours or in every pretty much every walk of life 
And then if we go into some of the industry use cases that they also have in the paper, so defect detection, this is uh, a good one. So defect detection, safety inspection, grocery checkout, we'll, uh, we'll look at those three. Um, there's something around spot the difference, which we'll move over here for now, but defect detection. So prompt, what is wrong with the object in this image? Uh, the LMM says that there is a small tear or hole in the fabric. So, you know, when you can imagine just the vast array of defect detection um, use cases that could be used um, with an LMM to uh, automatically identify some of these defects, which would be really powerful. Uh, there's another one here. Um, what's wrong with the object in this image? It's difficult to say for sure what's wrong with the object in the image. There is no context or information about what the object is or what it's supposed to look like. However, it appears that the copper wires in the blue and brown sections are frayed and not neatly arranged, which could indicate damage or poor quality. So, interesting. And I guess interesting because it's hesitating to actually give you a very formal answer to the question. I mean, it's it's identified something that is clearly a potentially a problem, but it's uh, it's not it's not confident enough to um, give a fully fledged answer to that. So then, moving on to another defect detection uh, example. So here, given image one, tell me what's wrong in image two. So here, on image one is your perfect product. This is what you want your product to look like every time you uh, create one. And here's image two, which is one of a thousand or a million or a trillion objects that will uh, trickle off your production line that you want to make sure is of the right level of quality. And you can compare it to the image in image one. And it says in image two, there is a small white spot on the lower, lower left side of the inner circle. This could be a defect or damage on the surface of the object. Safety inspection. So I think uh, we all know that uh, there is a need for us all to wear helmets in certain circumstances in industrial situations and that that is a really significant uh, health and safety requirement across, uh, across many industries. So how many people are wearing helmets? Um, it says here there are eight people wearing helmets in this picture. Actually, again, just to show that it isn't 100% right all the time, that's actually got it wrong. The way that it's broken down to actually being able to achieve it with much greater level of accuracy, certainly for this research paper, is it's actually taken each image um, of each person and then said, please determine whether the person in the image wears a helmet or not, and then summarise how many people are wearing helmets. So if you take each image, you can then see it's geolocated each of the people, it's extracted each of those people, it's then identified within each of those images who is and who isn't wearing a hat, and it says image one not wearing a hat, image two not wearing a hat, image three wearing a hat, and so on. And the summary is out of eight people, five are wearing helmets and three are not wearing helmets, which is entirely correct and then again if you look at the grocery checkout example um, first of all it says for the blow image find what products are presented in the basket try to be accurate um, and as we know for llms and as well as lmms um, there are some key phrases that you can use to help um, increase the accuracy things like try to be accurate or a particular favorite of mine which is take a deep breath um, anyway you can see it's actually not done so well with this example. It's got three or four of the items wrong, three or four of the items correct. So what you can do here is you can actually improve its um, understanding greatly. Um, and clearly there are you know, techniques such as RAG that you can do this within a, uh, an LMM type model where you can actually feed it with a set of reference images that are specifically from the store. Um, and then show it the image of the basket and the LMM will then come back and say there are five products in the basket that are exactly the same as the reference images. These are smoked ham, apple, pink tulips, crab dip and strawberries. So this time it's got it um, 
100% correct. <clears throat> now, on to medical, or shall I say back to medical. There are a few more um, x-rays and reports of radiology examples here. So here's a here's a, another good one. And this is actually reporting, uh, sorry, creating um, radiology reports from a picture. So the prompt says, write a radiology report as an expert radiologist for the following case. And again, good phrase here, as an expert radiologist. Uh, and the case which is provided as well is 32 year old woman presented with a complaint of pain in her right wrist. The patient reported that she fell on her outstretched hand while playing basketball. An x-ray of the right wrist was performed. Here's the x-ray. And GPT-4V creates a radiology report. Date, exam, indication, right wrist pain after falling on an outstretched hand while playing basketball. The findings, there is a transverse fracture of the distal radius with the with mild dorsal angulation. No other fractures or discolation, uh, dislocations are seen. The carpal bones are in normal alignment. No significant soft tissue swelling is noted. Impression, transverse fracture of the distal radius with mild dorsal angulation. No other fractures are discolation seen. Recommendations, orthopedic consultation for management of the fracture. And here you can see the fracture and uh, it's got that um, entirely, entirely right. So I was going to give this one go as well with um, with lava and let me just find the uh, picture so x-ray okay we'll say what um, is wrong with this person from their x-ray <clears throat> says from the x-ray it appears that the person has a broken collarbone which is also known as a fractured clavicle the x-ray shows the bone in the person's chest area specifically the clavicle which is broken and possibly displaced the injury typically occurs due to a fall or direct impact to the shoulder area. The person may require medical attention, such as a cast or a surgery, to help the bone heal properly and prevent further complications. Uh, and as you can see here, that is definitely a broken um, clavicle or uh, collarbone. So, um, well done, Lava. <clears throat> And as we keep going through the report, there are just, you know, yet more and more examples of really strong use cases that you can start thinking immediately for how you would use uh, an LLM, basically, that has the ability to um, review, access, create um, images. And on to the next example, which is auto insurance and damage evaluation. So uh, here's a picture of a car with a, a little bit of an accident. Um, doesn't look too major, but um, certainly scrapes the um, the front bumper by the looks of things. The prompt says, imagine that you're an expert in evaluating the car damage from a car accident for auto insurance reporting. Please evaluate the damage seen in the image below. And GPT-4V comes back. Based on the image, it appears that the car has sustained damage to the front passenger side bumper. The damage appears to be in the form of scrapes and scratches with some areas of the paint chipped away, etc. So pretty solid view of the damage and then here's one that's a bit more serious imagine you're a car you're an expert in evaluating the car damage from car accident for auto insurance reporting please evaluate the damage seen in the image below and the lmm comes back based on the image it appears that the vehicle has sustained significant damage to the front end the hood is crumpled and the front bumper is completely detached from the vehicle the headlights and grille are also damaged and the engine appears to be exposed additionally there is damage to the driver's side fender and door Given the extent of the damage, it's likely the vehicle was involved in a high-speed collision or a head-on collision. The cost of repairs for this vehicle will likely be significant and it may be deemed a total loss by the insurance company. Um, so again, pretty accurate representation of, of the picture. Uh, here's quite a neat um, consumer use case, which is organising photos. And um, it prompts with, here are the photos of my family members. So... Here's Linda, Cotton, Max, Sam, and Emma. And then it says, please describe the image with as many details as possible using my family members' names. 
And it gives you a very nice... This image is a family portrait of Linda and her children, Emma and Sam, along with their pets, Max the dog and Cotton the cat. Family is sitting in their living room, etc., etc. So a very nice caption that's customised very specifically. And again, you know, it does this for a different subset of the uh, of the family members. Um, I wanted to just to touch on a couple more, um, which were uh, an evaluation of a generated image. So this is where we're looking at um, images that have been generated from prompts and to what extent are they um, are they of a appropriate quality. So the prompt here is saying what is happening in the image from a scale of 1 to 10 decide how similar the image to the text prompt a parrot driving a car. Now clearly that doesn't look much like a parrot driving a car to me and the LMM comes back. In the image, there's a dolphin jumping out of the water. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would rate this image as a 1 in similarity to the text prompt, a parrot driving a car, um, as there is no parrot or car present in the image. And then finally, after a set of um, ever-increasingly more parroty pictures, uh, a prompt, what is happening in this image? From a scale of 1 to 10, decide how similar the image is to the text prompt, a parrot driving a car. And the LMM comes back. In the image, there are two parrots. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, I would rate this image a 9 in terms of similarity to the text prompt a parrot driving a car. The only reason it's not a perfect 10 is because there are two parrots in the image rather than just one, as the prompt suggests. Pretty good. Um, and now, specifically prompt generation for image editing. If you have an image here, this is the original image, um, the prompt I use to edit this image is I have it to look like a graphic novel. The edited, edited image that they got was this. Tell me how I should change my prompt to make the edited image better. So this is about taking the prompt and asking the LMM to suggest a better prompt to create a better image that matches what you've asked it for. And the LMM comes back, instead of using the prompt, have it look like a graphic novel, you could try being more specific with a prompt to guide the AI in the direction you want the image to go. For example, you could use prompts such as make the image look like a black and white comic book illustration or add bold lines and high contrast to the image to make it look like a graphic novel cover. This could help the AI better understand the aesthetic you are going for and produce a more refined edited image. And there here, if you look at actually that um, language that's been passed into pix to pix uh, with the original image and prompt this is the image you get and with the original image and the prompt that has been advised by the LMM you can see that actually the uh, the edited image is indeed um, more like a graphic novel and then <laughs> As we're coming closer towards the end of this um, vast but fascinating report, there's a whole section on embodied um, agents. And this is really the way in which we actually give the ability of our LMMs and our LLM, LLMs to physically interact with their environment. And this can be through um, a whole set of uh, plugins that allow us to um, connect our LLM to uh, the internet or to different services or the ability to see and act um, through a physical representation of it through a robot for example and here's a couple of examples of of an lmm taking those sorts of tasks of an embodied agent uh, i'll pass over that first one um, so this is about operating a coffee machine so the prompt says first read the operating menus below for coffee machine buttons so here's the menu there's uh, menu one six ounce is a certain cup logo menu two the eight ounce is a certain cup logo and the ten ounce is a certain cup logo now let's look at the operating panel of the actual coffee machine which is shown here which um, is obviously different to the menu but has the same logos on it and um, basically the, the 
the prompt is looking at these uh, images, which button should I use for a six ounce coffee? Left, right, top or bottom? bottom. And the LMM comes back quite correctly. You should use the left button for a six ounce coffee because that is the cup that is filled just very slightly. Okay, and then if you go the step further to creating a embodied agent that could actually operate a, um, a robot, for example. Um, here's an interesting set of navigation prompts. Imagine that you're a home robot and are asked to go to the kitchen to fetch something from the fridge. The image below shows your current position. Please plan your next action. So here's the image and the LMM comes back. My next action would be to turn right and move forward towards the hallway as I can see that the kitchen is likely located in that direction. I would then continue to navigate through the hallway until I reach the kitchen and locate the fridge. The prompt then says, given where you are and the action taken in a previous turn, now you are at the hallway. This is what you can see from there. And here's the new picture. Can you see the kitchen from here? What is your next action? So with this prompt and the, and the pre previous information still being fed in, uh, the LMM now says, from the current position, I can see the kitchen on the right side. My next action would be to turn right and move towards forward towards the kitchen. So again, repeating that previous step, uh, the action taken in previous turn is turn right and move forward towards the kitchen. And the, pr and the prompt now comes, now you're at the kitchen, this is what you can see from there. Can you see the fridge from here? What is your next action? So here's the picture of the kitchen. From this position, I can see the fridge on the right hand side of the kitchen. My next action would be to move forward and turn slightly to the right to approach the fridge. And so the prompt continues. It says the action taken in the previous turn is move forward and turn slightly right towards the fridge, which is located here. Uh, it says now what is your next action? My next action would be to move forward and slightly turn slightly to the left to align myself with the fridge door. Then I would use my robotic arm to open the fridge door and retrieve the requested item. So pretty strong level of recognition of imagery and location of that um, position, geolocation, if you like, within those, uh, within those images. Uh, and then Coming towards the end, a couple of couple of quite neat areas of how would you get an LMM to actually help you navigate um, across your computer or across your device. And indeed, it can do that too. Uh, so here's a picture of a Windows operating screen and it says screen. And it says, imagine you're a robot operating a computer like how humans operate the computer. You can move the mouse. You can click an icon with a mouse or type some text with a keyboard. You're asked to find a detailed recipe of um, good old Mapo Tofu again. Below is what you see on the computer screen. Predict your next move. If the action involves moving the mouse, describe the location as detailed as possible. And the LMM comes back. Next move. I would move the mouse to the Google Chrome icon located on the left side of the screen, approximately one third of the way down from the top. I would then click on the icon to open the web browser. And the prompt says, imagine that you're a robot operating a computer. You can move the mouse. You're asked to find a detailed recipe on Mapu Tofu. It says the previous action again. And now it says you've now opened the web browser. Below is what you see on the computer screen. What will you do next? And here's the browser screen. And it goes on and on, uh, basically describing. I'd move the mouse to the search bar. I would then click on the search bar and type in Mapu Tofu recipe, etc., etc. And as it goes through here, the LMM directs the selection of the recipe and getting to the uh, ingredients of that recipe for you, which is um, pretty impressive. Okay. And one of the final examples I wanted to, um, to share with you was, uh, again, phone. So you have your iPhone and you want to uh, you want to have your AI navigate your um, iPhone to actually carry out a task. And remember, at this point, you are probably talking to your phone um, and 
giving it um, speech to text, which it's understanding through the uh, through the Whisper um, system that's part of the GPT for user interface. You're talking to it and you're watching the AI actually operate your phone for you. And the prompt here is saying, imagine that you're a robot operating a phone. Like how humans operate in the phone, you can move your finger to an icon, click an icon with your finger, scroll down the screen or type some text with a keyboard. You're asked to stop shop for an ergonomic keyboard. Your budget is between $50 and $100. Below is what you see on the phone screen. Predict your next move. If the action involves moving your finger to an icon, describe the location of that icon as detailed as possible. So, you know, imagine in the actual use case, you are literally talking to your phone and the phone is carrying out these steps, not because you're actually describing this prompt in every single level of detail, but because some of this is trained and pre-trained and prompted for you. And therefore you only have to give it the very basic instructions of what you're actually trying to do. Um, but yeah, the LMM here, it directly goes to, surprise, surprise, the Amazon icon, which is located on, it says, the third row and third column. Slight error there again, but it takes you into the Amazon website. It tells you how to search um, for the products that you want, the ergonomic keyboard in Amazon. It looks at the different products that you've um, got um, available. It helps you select that object. And shows you the different uh, products that are available. And basically takes you through to the point of actually finding the products and ordering it. All with the AI and you not touching your phone at all. And then finally, I just wanted to come on to a really exciting part of this research paper, which is talking about LMM powered agents and you know, a couple of examples um, within that. And this is looking at how the LMM can actually do things or use things like self-reflection to improve its actual own performance. So here we've got a picture of a dog uh, and the prompt says, given a user imagined idea of the scene, Convert the idea into a self-contained sentence prompt that will be used to generate an image. Um, so the idea is photo of a dog looks like the one in the given image running on the beach. So that's the idea is take the photo of the dog and create an image of that dog running on the beach. This is based upon the above information. I wrote a detailed prompt exactly about the idea. Follow the rules. And here is the LMM. So there's a blue dog running on the beach with a happy expression on its face. And Stable Diffusion picks up that prompt that's been created by the LMM and creates, yes, a picture of a blue dog running on a beach. However, um, it doesn't look so much like the dog in question. So the prompt comes. I'm and says, I'm iteratively improving the sentence prompt by looking at the images generated by an AI art generation model and find out what's different from the given idea. The idea is the photo of the dog on the beach that we know. Um, the generated sentence prompt for the current round is a blue dog running on the beach with a happy expression on its face. That's what um, the LMM gave us last time. The corresponding image generated by that model, and we paste in the model, um, and now we are telling um, the LMM that the combination of that prompt and that image is not perfect. What are the key reasons on how to further improve the image to better follow the user imagined idea of the scene? And the LMM comes back. The dog in the generated image does not look like the one in the given image. This image doesn't, this dog doesn't look like this dog. The dog in the given image is a pug. Well, the dog in the generated image is a different breed. To address this issue, we can modify the prompt to specifically mention that the dog should be a pug. So now the LMM is correcting itself and reflecting on its past efforts as to what it should now do to create a better image of a pug running on a beach. 
So the prompt becomes, given a user imagined idea of the scene, converting the idea into a sentence prompt that will be used to generate an image, I'm iteratively improving the sentence prompt by looking at the images generated by an AI generation model and find out what is different. The idea, a photo of a dog beach, generated sentence for the current round is a blue dog running on the beach, etc., etc. Um, corresponding image generated by the AI art model is this. And now you carry on saying the image can be improved because the dog should be a pug. Based upon the above information to improve the image, I wrote a detailed prompt exactly about the idea to follow the rules. And the LMM comes back with the following description. A blue pug running on the beach with a happy expression on its face with a sunset and palm trees in the background. And Stable Diffusion comes back with ooh, a blue pug running on the beach with a happy expression on its face. So there you have it, a walk through one of the most seminal papers, um, one of the most seminal research papers um, in generative AI history in the last 12 months, um, certainly. Um, as I said at the beginning of um, this episode, multimodal um, generative AI is completely the future of artificial intelligence. It's the way in which we will interact more naturally and more seamlessly with our computers and how the artificial intelligence will act and react more seamlessly and more effortlessly with us and our environment and it will truly transform what is already a hugely exciting uh, field and development in the field of artificial intelligence. I look forward to uh, seeing you again on the next episode of I for AI but for now uh, my name is Tim Elson. You have been watching I for AI bringing artificial intelligence to all of humanity.